Our final um, formal speaker is uh, Dr. Omar Eno, who's a multilingual scholar and poet. He teaches interdisciplinary studies at Atlas University of Somalia, and he's also an adjunct professor of African history at Portland State University in the U.S. He was formerly the director of the African Migration and Development Research Program at Portland State. Um, he is, uh, was centrally involved in securing the resettlement of about 14,000 uh, members of the Somali Bantu ethnic community uh, from Somalia, from refugee camps around Somalia to uh, the U.S. during the early 2000s, um, and is now uh, involved in the establishment of Atlas University as well as um, several different research projects, which he may tell us about this evening. He's the author of many different um, scholarly works on, on Somali society. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Omar. Good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Omar Eno, and uh, I'm now based in Somalia, helping the Ministry of Education revive the National Somali University that collapsed some time back. And also, I have opened in uh, a, a, a joint effort of a university called Atlas University in Somalia. And uh, uh, I was told to announce it and say that that university is the first university for the minorities. <laughs> I have been going to Somalia. Hassan Sheikh wanted to appoint me minister several times. I refused. And. Uh, <laughs> No, he, I'm not accusing. He's a good man. He's a, he's, he's a very smart guy. I had a long discussion with him. But I just don't want to be in politics. And uh, the situation is that whenever I went to Somalia, I sat down with cross-clan minority students. And I asked them, you are always pushed aside as a minority, even though we'll talk about it. Nobody knows who's majority and who's minority. And they said, we come from very poor family. We cannot afford to go to university. We are stuck with a higher school diploma. And some of them could not even retrieve their diploma certificate from the ministry because you have to pay $30. They don't have the $30. So there were 200 scholarships that came. None of the minorities participated because they don't have the diplomas to show, because they don't have the $30 to collect the certificate. And they are very intelligent, very smart, talented. I paid for 10 of them. I wish I could pay more, but uh, my hands were tight. Anyway, there's Atlas University of Somalia, whoever is here, who is from the minority, from the majority, from whatever you are, <laughs> please let them know that if a student cannot afford to go to other universities in Somalia that are paid highly, we look sponsors for them, and we, if they are intelligent, if they have higher grade, we accept them, we put them in the university. I leave that one there. I don't think you are going to be happy with me, but let me start. <laughs> According to Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and uh, uh, Political Rights, it says, in those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in the community with other members of their group 
to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language. Is that happening in Somalia? Ask yourself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have not come here to praise Somalia and Somalians. I have not come here to insult Somalia and Somalians either. Some of you, you may not like to hear the sordid details of Somalia's hollow homogeneity, when in reality, they are distinct communities that are overtly and heartlessly discriminated. Therefore, my positions will be clearly stated, and I hope we shall have enough time to debate dialectically, and I underline, I don't want, and it's not worth nonsense debate, dialectical debate is what I am I'm looking forward. On some of the issues that I'm about to raise on minorities, particularly the Bantu Jarir, the Baydari, Gaboye, Barawa, Banadiri, and uh, many other ones. Ask this question to yourself. If Somalis are homogeneous, same, same, same culture, same language, same tradition, same whatnot, same everything, why are we so divided and un so uncompromising, so irreconcilable for the past over two decades? Why? What is the difference? If we have everything same, what is the problem? Another major myth that Somalia is suffering from is a, as he mentioned, my, my colleague here, is a superiority complex. In other words, they adamantly deny, they, 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 they adamantly in denial of being identified as Africans. Subsequently, this created, this created a Somalia that is in Africa, but not of Africa. I quote Casanelli here, Livy Casanelli. He says, the myth of the culturally homogeneous nation, a myth which seemed to set Somalia apart from most of other African states, will have to be replaced by a new model that recognizes the significance in recent Somali history of divisions of, cla divisions of class, color, occupation, and language. These societal divisions are not necessarily immutable, but analysts can no longer afford to ignore them if they seek to understand the contemporary crisis in the Horn of Africa. You cannot deny anymore. Therefore, in reality, Somalia is a nation that holds together people of different cultures, different customs, different traditions, different language, and different values different destiny. However, they theoretically share the Islamic religion of Sunni sect. By the way, being diverse does not mean we cannot live together. We can. Being di diverse does, does not mean we can't find a modern and flexible system that respects our differences. We can find. We can live together and we can be diverse. There are countries like Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda. They have 50 tribes. They have 50 languages. And they are a nation. They are intact. They are together. They are working. So why do you deny my language? Why do you impose on me your language? Why? If you want to kill a society, I have seen this in the US and the Canada, you first take away the language. When you want to kill a culture, you take away from them the language. Then that culture is dead. You know why? Because you are adopting another language and you are always told, no, you are not the master of the language. Stand behind. Because you adopted this language. It's not your language. So many young men in my country, in, in Somalia, they have been robbed of their, of their culture. I was in primary, I don't know if we have time to, dis, to, to finish this. 
I was in a primary school. I went to register. There's this old man that came. He's a Rahawin. Wrongly called Rahawin, but they are Rewin. There is no Rahawin. He came to register his son at the same school. Me, I was already registered, but we are just standing there. So he doesn't speak another language. He speaks only the Rewin language. Is that a crime? So the headmaster, he said, uh, I want my son to be registered. I am here. I was living somewhere else, so I moved now here in this area. This school is near to my children. I want to be registered. And listen what the headmaster disturbed, uh, answered. He says, what so mali di bang You are laughing now, but what does he feel, this young kid, at that age of five, six years old? Uh, let me translate. An old man came to register his son in a school that he moved in that area. And the headmaster tells him, because he was speaking a different language. In a Som it's a Somali language, but different. But the headmaster didn't understand. Now the headmaster answers the father, look at him. We can't get spaces for Somali children. And he's asking for space. So he, who is he? Where did he come? He's, he's a Somali. So if I tell you my, the historical background of what happened to me and what happened to my brother, which he all registered, his book is called uh, Unearthing Apartheid in Somalia. You can't believe. When my brother graduated from primary, all the teachers, all the parents were invited there, and uh, my brother was number one in the school. The headmaster was Ustad Abdullah. He was a half Arab. And Ustad Abdullah, then children are given their certificate. They called their name, and the parents are there. My brother was called, and he went to get his certificate because he scored all 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. So the headmaster said, this is the kind of student we want. This is the kind of student who will help tomorrow the country, the what not, and what not. And an old parent stood up and talked to the master and said, I knew you will not like it. <laughs> you see, my brother scored 100 in every point because I am a Bantu. My brother is a Bantu or a Jarer, whatever you want to call it locally. So a parent from the dominant clan Somali says, he told the headmaster, are you trying to tell us all of our children were defeated by this slave. Because we are considered a slave in Somalia. Not only we, every African Negroid looking person, if your nose is big, if your hair is kinky, you are a slave. I don't know who owns me. <laughs> I'm looking for my master I don't see yet. <laughs> So, let me, let me go back what Ali Jim'ali says here. Professor Ali Jim'ali, he's talking about Somali intellectuals. He says, um, he says, uh, he, he describes Somali intellectual, he says, there is always a tendency among Somali intellectuals to hunt for the unnecessary rather than examining things and ideas on merit. For me, he says, for him, therefore, an intellectual of any sort is the person who, he's quoting Gramsci now, as the person who assumes that the purpose of discussion is the pursuit of truth. Now, he continues, such an intellectual is one who attempts to identify problems, reflects on them, 
and does not shy away from asking hard and unpleasant questions, I didn't shy away, eh? I explained. <laughs> <laughs> and who suggests, not imposes, some type of solution to the problem under his or her scrutiny. So he concludes and says, therefore, I would argue that an overwhelming number of Somali intellectuals are simply university and college graduates. Because education which does not bring about a transformation in the consciousness of the educated is hardly beneficial to the individual, let alone to society. If you are educated, and the education is not bringing any transformation in you, you still go back to your tribe. You still go back to the nonsense of calling me, or I don't, but I be the but I, which I don't understand. You see, but like now I'm not called Adon because I'm a professor. Everybody knows there's a little resource around me. Everybody will come. <laughs> now I'm removed from Adon to Adonhood. Now, what Sudan way? I'm here by Sudan. I'm not Sudan. Adon. <laughs> So, therefore, here I think the Chinese proverb I picked is, is very handy here, is useful. It says, to know and not to act is not to know. If you know something, you don't act on it, then you don't know it. So, I wish we had enough time. <laughs> 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 now, this is, this is the, uh, uh, where I come to the character, which I think Burhan, most of it he covered. I, I, I thank him. It's the first time I, I, met, I, I meet him, and I heard about him, and I read, but I never met him. The, the character of a nomad or a pastoralist is to disdain agriculture. Not only that, to disdain any manual job. They don't want to do anything that involves handwork. How do you progress? How do you develop? You tell me. That this, this missiles that are being sent, this technology that is happening among the Japanese and all this, do you think it came because of Gabay Gabay? <laughs> no. It started with a hand. And now I am doing the handwork. You insult me because of doing the handwork. Kabaha Lugu Tole, Borsa Lugu you respect the Italian who makes the shoes and the handbag. But the one who is with you, who's a Somali who makes the shoe, the knife, the metal, you, 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 you derogatively, derogatively uh, abuse. Ask yourself, are you, are you intelligent, really? We will come to the intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> So we leave that one there. Now, Somalis fit in Africa. There's a book, uh, there's an article we wrote in a book, me and my brother. It's called uh, Who is an African? I, I, I removed uh, 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 a clause from that article which we published in that book. Afri Somalis deny Africanity. They do not want to be identified as African. They want to be Arabs. And the Arabs are pushing them. <laughs> there's a dilemma here. You see, there's identity crisis here now. I don't have identity crisis. <laughs> I'm an African, and there are so many Africans in Africa. I don't have identity crisis. You can call me whatever you want. But I have identity. You do not have identity now, because the Arabs have refused you. They are telling you, Ya Abid. 
And you're better off to accept me as your brother rather than going to an Arab. <laughs> So, we called Somalis, in that article, Africanity by accident of geography. <laughs> this group consists of those who happen to be in Africa without their wish to be there. Individuals who found themselves living in the continent by virtue of circumstances beyond their control. In other words, circumstantial Africans. Members of this group are not pleased to be identified with negritude or blackness, be it by value, ideology, culture, ethnicity, or any other quality except by the accident of being in, Afri in, in Africa, of existing on the continent. So the only time that a Somali nomad or a pastoralist, and I have nothing against nomads, eh? The only time he or she will accept to be an African, or <laughs> she or he may instantly turn around from Arab to Africa, is if she or he encounters discrimination of identity, denial from that group. And I have seen this in Egypt. I have seen it in Saudi Arabia. And I have seen it in Canada. I'm a Canadian. By you know, naturalization. <laughs> you see? So in Canada, they come to complain. I was teaching at York University in Canada. We're not allowed to go to Canada. And I tell them, welcome to the real world. <laughs> You know, in Canada, I used to teach at York University. Some of my students, they come to me and they say, Prof, these white people, they discriminate us. This is not right. Me, this, this. I said, yes, welcome to the real world. Because I have training for discrimination. You gave me. Back home, you gave me that training. To me, this piece of cake. <laughs> I never felt even single day in Canada that I was discriminated. Never. Because I was already prepared by you guys. OK. People from all over the world do view diversity as strength, except the Somali nomads, who consider is a, a divis divisive uh, culture. According to Van Ben Berge, uh, this guy is, uh, I think, he's a, he's a Belgium. Cultural, he says, cultural diversity is necessary condition of human evolution and advancement. Normally, within a homogeneous society, the people are supposed to get along wonderfully since they all share the same culture, tradition, language, and religion. However, as the Somali situation conspicuously shows, being homogeneous from uh, being homo uh, homogeneous or claiming to be homogeneous society did not save the country from plunging into the abyss of annihilation and anarchy. Instead, many diverse communities, as I told you earlier, they are together. Tanzanian, 50 language, Kenyan, 60 language, and they are one nation. They are living together, they are moving ahead. Where, while we are stuck with this is my what, this is my language, I am better than you. Imagine when Somali language was being written. They all picked from the nomadic group, those who wrote the language. And look how they underestimated other languages. When they found a word that, is, that does not exist in the Somali language, they went to borrow it from Arab language. What about the other languages who exist here? Maybe they have that, that word. Why don't you respect and borrow from them? I am hoping you guys are students and uh, intellectuals towards intellectuality or academia. I hope you will change your way of thinking. 
Because if we continue this way, what is happening there, we are doomed. Believe me. I wanted to give you the history of the Bantu, but I don't know if we have time. You see, uh, there are two groups of Somali Bantu in Somalia. Those along the Shebeli River, both banks of the Shebeli River, and those along the Juba River. Those along the Shebeli River were there even before the Somalis came. Those along the Juba River are those who were duped by Arabs, Omanis, into slavery. They brought as a cheap laborer at the beginning, but when they brought them into uh, Somalia, they were turned into slaves. And that is why they ran away from slavery and established their own uh, 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 polity in Gosha, around Kismayo area. When they ran away, their intention was to go back to their country of origin. <laughs> Originally, those in the Gosha, they are from Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique. Arabs brought them, Omanis, Said Said, who controlled the whole coast. I teach history. If I start this, it's, I'm, I will not finish. <laughs> so you see, there are these two groups of Somalis. One is native, and one came. Now, because they look alike, you all lump them. All they are Adomo. They are all slaves. Those along Shabel River, they were not slaves. They had nothing to do with slavery. But because now you, somebody is, has the power, somebody has took over the government, uh, immediately after the Italians left, I cannot, I have a lot, I wrote a lot here on that, but I don't think I can, I have enough time to cover. So, the Bantus fell victims, those who are even natives. Now, this is the question I start in my PhD thesis. I start with seven questions, then I answer those questions. <laughs> One of the questions is, you told me I am not a Somali. I was brought here as a slave. You, you are an Arab. You came here. And the country we are talking is in Africa. And I am the African. Isn't here a dilemma? <laughs> I am the African who is in Africa. But you are the Arab who came, and now you tell me I don't own this country, it's not mine, and I am the African. So who came here? Is it the Arab who came or the African who came? <laughs> this is the, one of the questions I, I start with my thesis. So you see, it is good to study, it's good to go to school, because if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have been able to talk to you like this, because I remember in Toronto, uh, University of Toronto, it was a Somali Independence Day, and we were talking about Somalia, there was a forum like this, and a Barawi, a Barawa man said, we are talking of Somalia, we are talking of this, we are talking of government. Our women were raped and they were taken to somewhere in central area up to today, we don't know, they are in central region. They took the women and they went with the, with, with the women in the central region. Now he says, me, I want my children to be brought back. Somebody who was sitting at the back because there is no space to walk and the, the guy who's asking the question is in front. So that guy, he's one of your cousins or brothers, he stood up <laughs> and he says, What are Look the ignorance. 
This is not a place to slap somebody. There's a security guard, he will throw you out. There's no gun here. I talk the way I want. I tell you the truth. It may be painful, but it is. Swallow it. Unless you want to change. I don't want to marry you. I don't want anything. I married Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> because you, th there is this cultural belief that a Jerer or a Madivan or a Mary Gaboye, he cannot marry the other Somali group. Why? Why can't he marry? Oh, sorry. Tell me, why can't he marry? What is the reason? In my had the good sister as a Dankala Kujurtu. Dankala Kujurtu. No, no, no. Ah, what? Will you go there? That's Fiana Ahayan. Will you go there? They were good. They were good always. I was a lecturer at the University of Minnesota. Some girls proposed, why are you complaining? Are you ready to marry? I said, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> now you want me, yeah. <laughs> because I'm a professor now, I'm okay now, now yeah, now why not? There's, there's something now. But when I was suffering in uh, Barack Abdo and, and Bull Ally, you didn't want me that time, no. And I'm not stupid enough to, to embrace you now. No. I will take my resources whoever deserves. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so uh, I missed my, my, my writing. So the thing is, I, I think let us con conclude this thing because, because of time. I think we don't have enough time. We have to stop this thing. Uh, but I wish there was enough time. Huh? Yeah, it's vice versa, but I still don't believe it. Uh, that is the problem. Now, this is how he. Wow, I saw it in the Toronto. All Somali girls are befriending Jamaicans. And Somali men are getting angry. They are getting mad. I tell him, why you get blood pressure for nothing? Because he cannot go and threaten a Jamaican the way he threatens me at home. <laughs> a Jamaican will spill his brain out. <laughs> you see the reality? Why Somali? I never did get Siban and Haidira. We are Jamaican, why can't we stop them? Why don't we stop the Jamaicans from our girls? You stop from me. I'm your brother, I speak your language, we grew up together, we went to same school, you underestimate me. But the Jamaican, you cannot go near. Oh, what have you done, Allah, about here? You see? <laughs> so you are a coward, in a way. <laughs> okay, now, let's finish this. <laughs> this is what Sharif Idrus said when he was uh, reading uh, a paper, I'm, I'm concluding it. Eh? He was reading a paper in the Canadian Parliament. I took a section from his paper. He says, it is our duty to educate the misinformed that we are not members of the same ethnic linguistic background. It is also our responsibility to correct past mistakes and be proud of our diversity. Accepting the status quo is a violation of the Charter of Human Rights and Freedom. But the bottom line must be clear. Our right to our own identity, integrity, and ethnicity is a sacrosanct. Inclusion of false homogeneity is not absolute. We are not going to accept genocide to our culture, dignity, ethnicity, or language. Now, the last sentence. We, the minorities, by the way, nobody knows, I told you, eh? 
I found in France, in France, archive, a statistic that was done by United Nations in 1940, before independence. That time, we were majority. As he said, we were majority that time. But when Somalia got independence, every buffoon who became in charge claimed to be the majority. And Siad Bari did statistics. You remember Tirakobka, Tirakobka Umada. People were counted. You know, Siad Bari had another image. He thought they are going to be majority, all the other, what, what, what. Then when the results came, he was shocked. That statistic research was not revealed. So you can claim majority, one day it's going to haunt you. <laughs> now, we the minorities have a positive and a progressive vision of how Somalia should be with your help all of you, and the contribution from your area of expertise, we would like to turn this vision into reality. 